Nelson Mandela died last night and I was listening to moving interviews, the captain of the Springboks, talking about the moment when Nelson Mandela arrived in a helicopter and said to the Springboks team, thank you for everything you have done for South Africa. And they turned to him and said, no, thank you for everything you have done for South Africa. Because Nelson Mandela managed to say to a society that had a systemic belief that racism was natural, was inevitable, that there was no other framework in which whites and blacks could live side by side. Nelson Mandela shifted the paradigm and people saw a different universe could exist and it does exist. So help. I need a man. Well, I need as many men as possible. In fact, I need all men, which is roughly 49% of the world's population, to decide that they want a paradigm shift. What woman is going to arrive on a helicopter to the universe of men and say thank you for creating a world of gender equality? And the men will turn around and say no, thank you for creating a world of gender equality. Nelson Mandela recognised there was no world in South Africa of equal rights for whites and blacks unless whites and blacks did it together. And there is no world of gender equality unless men and women do it together. <coughs> I'm all for sisters doing it for themselves. But, you know, brothers, fathers, friends, lovers, they're all needed. And I'll explain why. <coughs> It's because gender equality is not a minority interest. Imagine if you've been brought up and you've been told over and over again that you're a minority interest. And even though you know, because you've done maths, that 51% of the population suggests this can't be true, nevertheless, if you are told over and over again it's a minority interest, you automatically curb your desire to raise the issue of inequality since it happens all the time and yet if it's a minority interest it can't be much interesting to many people can it and if you want as a woman or as a young girl to not feel that people look on you as somebody who is a crack record a stuck paragraph something that's raising this issue over and over again it is amazing how quickly you decide to divert a conversation that's sexist, to ignore a conversation that's misogynist, to laugh at a joke that's inappropriate, to put to one side an issue that you know is framed from bad behaviour. And it's amazing how quickly you will let your own boundaries be crossed. And that is because you've been taught it's a minority interest. It's also because it's undignified to be a victim. How many of you girls and women want to be told all the time that you're at the bottom of society, that you're a victim, that you're a problem? You don't. You want to be free of the idea of being a woman. You don't wake up every morning thinking, well, I'm a woman. What am I going to do as a woman today? You think, I'm me. What shall I do with my time? And yet, constantly, you are being asked to be considered in terms of, well, what's it like being a woman director, a woman journalist, a woman author, a woman filmmaker, back into being of minority interest. And my belief is that if you believe that you are a minority interest, you are going to be responsible for sexism and misogyny becoming a constant epidemic that flares up again and again. And I don't want us to believe that we are on a natural process of progress. Because I think unless we can move away from this idea that we are a minority interest, we will not be moving away from letting little moments go by. And those little moments accumulate to constantly create epidemic flare-ups which sustain the idea of inequality. Now, I'll give you a moment when I stopped letting things go by any longer. And it was really to do with my daughter. She was four. She and I went together to see E.T. Who's seen E.T.? Oh, and, and I saw you all smile. 
E.T., who could not love that film? I do. And so here we are, E.T.'s in the basket, in the front, and all the boys and the girl are on their bikes and they're riding E.T. away from the enemy. Do you all remember? And his little heart's going and he's desperate to go home. <laughs> and they might just make it if the baddies don't get them. But the baddies are closing the gap, they're nearer and nearer, the John Williams music comes in, and all of a sudden, they all fly up over the moon. And it's going to be fine. And guess who's not flown with them? The little girl on the pink bike, <laughs> who's looking up, going, well, they obviously don't need me. And they didn't. And my four-year-old burst into tears. And she said, can't I go with E.T.? And I said, I'll have a word with Steven Spielberg. <laughs> And that was when I thought, we cannot do this unless men are interested in telling the story of a shared world. It can't just be boys flying over the moon. <laughs> if you think you're a minority interest and you let little moments go by, then the epidemic will flare up all over the place. And this is why, although I'm a natural optimist, I have to alert us to the fact that it is not inevitable that women's rights will come about and the world will be equal. Because for whatever reason, through conditioning, through cultural passing on, through whatever particular moments we have in thinking that's what society looks like, it's a bit like being in the fourth, trying to look for what the fourth dimension looks like. What is the world when it isn't, when it isn't in this situation of men being more uh, useful and more important and more central than women. What does that world look like? Speaking in the cultural sector, as I do, there is no canon of literature, no canon of playwriting, no canon of filmmaking, no canon of music that tells me that the woman has the divine right to speak on behalf of the world. It has not yet been given to her. And for that reason, boys don't buy girls' books. Boys don't watch men's, work, work, women's <coughs> films. Men don't participate in a world that is for women. And I want men to care for women differently because we care for you. We love you. We'd like you to love us differently. Now, when epidemics spring up and it's cholera or polio or AIDS, everybody rushes to that and says, if we don't stamp that out there, this epidemic is going to be pan-epidemic and something is done about it. There's zero tolerance for cholera. But not for rape. There is not zero tolerance for sex slavery. There is not zero tolerance for issues to do with women's bodies. There is not zero tolerance for lack of choice for women about marriage, about education, about the right to drive. <coughs> we have no zero tolerance about what is happening to women across the world. And actually, women in so-called developed countries prefer to talk about the problems in the Swat Valley or in Afghanistan, rather than attend to their own backyard, because it's dispiriting and humiliating to recognize the fact that this is still here. But it is just as humiliating and dispiriting for a Palestinian woman to hear a Western woman in, in, in the UK saying, well, actually, we're not doing too bad, actually. We're all fine. But we're so sorry that you're not part of the peace process. I've just come back from Derry. Those women were part of the peace process, and they are no longer part of it. I started WOW, the Women of the World Festival, four years ago at South Bank Centre because I felt it was inappropriate for me to carry on saying, I notice that the world is unequal, but I'm too proud to put my own head above the line and do something about it. And so I started this festival. It's every year. I'm just flicking through slides, really, to show you that it's trying to reach all women, all ages. They're very little. <laughs> and it's for men and women to think together about what would a world that is equal look like? And could we, like Nelson Mandela and the Springboks say together, we are so glad it's equal. WOW is now, I hope, having its own contagious effect. We're doing it in other parts of the UK. We've done it in uh, Baltimore. We're doing it in, uh, in, in uh, Australia. And in fact, in Australia, we've just done it in Catherine, which is one of the most uh, 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 Aboriginal, uh, it's an Aboriginal territory. It's one of the most um, forgotten territories 
hardly anybody lives there except this group of Aboriginal settlers and white settlers. And together they use wow to talk about their shared interests. Women need to decide that gender equality is as important to them as blacks in South Africa decided it was as important. Because if they don't to do it together, and if they don't make young women feel that their abuse and, and people overlooking their chances is something that we all care about, if we don't do that, then we're basically letting the human race down. And so the final thing I wanted to say to this group of people here today is you've heard about, and you will hear about, the extraordinary history of women pioneers and how many men helped those women get there. This is not something that women have ever done on their own, and it's not something that men have always just left women to it. There have always been alliances, there have always been amazing moments when there's been a big push together. I'm starting a festival in January called Being a Man. I hope you'll come, men. Because <laughs> men also deserve and need space to time, reflect and change. Because we are all in a world that has said, actually, men and women are not equal. And we're all struggling with how to change that paradigm. But women, can I ask you to encourage your male friends, lovers, fathers, sons to take this on as a responsibility that will be better for their life? And men... Can I ask you to do that? Will you do that? You're here today. Don't think of yourself as simply supporting your women. Do it for yourself. Men can do feminism for themselves. Men can be feminists too. Thank you very much.